The following presentation is an adaptation summary of the validation workshop that was held on April 26, 2018. All concepts presented are based on input received from the public. They are not real proposals, but rather are ideas intended to generate thought and conversation about the future of Boiling Springs. Input received during the community visioning workshops will be shared with Spartanburg County to inform the area performance planning process that will take place in the future. Thank you for your interest in the Heart of Boiling Springs Community Visioning Workshops. The Community Visioning Workshops for the Boiling Springs community has been a lengthy process where we have uh, reached out to the community of Boiling Springs to get your input on what you would like to see happen for the future. My name is Ernie Bauman. I am the uh, Director of Operations for the Southeast Region for Tool Design Group. Uh, we are a consulting firm. Uh, our office is in downtown Spartanburg. Um, I am a consultant that specializes in uh, transportation and land use planning but I am also a member of the Boiling Springs community living here uh, in the community. And so I have a vested interest uh, in what's going on here and am happy to be donating my time to this effort. Um, do want you to know uh, that we have gone through a process uh, with these visioning workshops. Uh, it has been open, it has been transparent, and it has been a community dialogue. Uh, we had our uh, initial public meeting on March 22nd and that was our discovery workshop uh, where we had a large turnout of about 130 folks but prior to that the Heart of Boiling Springs uh, citizens group that formed uh, had actually done a lot of outreach to the community through pop-up sessions where they would go to events throughout the community intercept surveys uh, and that type of outreach so the word had gotten out pretty widely uh, we again had 130 people at that first uh, discovery workshop on March 22nd. The intent of these uh, meetings is to identify community guiding principles. Essentially, what is important to this community? What are the non-negotiables? What are the things that make Boiling Springs, Boiling Springs? We wanted to encourage the community to think about its future, uh, to not uh, just uh, say things are going to happen the way they're going to happen, but to say what, what could be a, a better future for Boiling Springs. Uh, I, I like the statement of you don't have to be sick to get better and that's the case with Boiling Springs. This is a wonderful community uh, that uh, certainly uh, has many many possibilities. And then finally uh, the purpose of the visioning workshops is that Spartanburg County is going through a planning process of its own uh, throughout the entire county. Uh, they are in the process of completing the southwest area of the county right now and we'll be moving on to other parts of the county in the future. And this is their area performance planning process. And so what we wanted to do with these community visioning workshops is to kind of tee up for that to allow the community to begin thinking about the future prior to Spartanburg County uh, having their meetings to ask about those things. So again, this has been a transparent public process. You can see here that uh, we have done extensive outreach. We've had two public workshops. Uh, We've had five pop-up meetings, uh, 18 stakeholder meetings, and prior to our uh, validation workshop on April 26, we had had over 500 participants. Uh, at the validation workshop on April 26, we had about another 80 folks join us there. So we were right at 600 total participants. And for a community the size of Boiling Springs in an unincorporated area of a county, this is an exceptional, exceptional number of people to have involved. We're just very thankful uh, for the public's interest and their input and participation. So some of the things we asked, uh, asked the community of Boiling Springs uh, through not only the first public workshop uh, in March, but also in the pop-up events and intercept surveys prior to that, we asked a number of questions to get a feel for uh, who was answering the questions and also uh, the priorities those folks have. And so you can see here that 77% of the people who responded live in Boiling Springs, 29% work in Boiling Springs, and roughly half or 45% have children or grandchildren that attend schools in Boiling Springs. 
Further, uh, we asked how folks use Highway 9 and uh, what destinations they reach using Highway 9. And we asked this in two different ways. We asked how do you use Highway 9 to reach things within Boiling Springs, and then also how do you use Highway 9 to reach these destinations in other parts of the county. You can see here that uh, shopping, restaurants, and recreation uh, all scored very highly in both of these questions. Uh, church uh, was fairly high in the in Boiling Springs, which is not uncommon that we generally attend churches more uh, closer to our homes. And uh, then you see school as well uh, in that mix um, with work uh, coming in, uh, in, the, in the school and work being kind of in the, in the bottom tier on both of those. We asked the question uh, if folks would support greater emphasis on the type, style, character, and placement of development. And 68% of respondents said yes, they would support greater emphasis on the type, style, character, and placement of development. Um, no answers were 3%, not sure at 15%, and no answer at 14%. Now what's interesting about these answers is generally when we are uh, certainly opposed to something, we answer no. Uh, we, would not, we do not answer not sure or no answer. So with only 3% saying no, that uh, is telling. Uh, but what is also telling is uh, the nearly 30% that either said they were not sure or chose not to answer this question, which means there may be uh, a need for additional education on what exactly it means uh, to have greater emphasis on the type, style, character, and placement of development. What are you concerned about? Uh, you can see here that uh, folks are very concerned about traffic congestion at 88%. Um, and again, keep in mind these percentages do not total to 100% uh, because folks could uh, check uh, more than one. So these are based on the number of respondents uh, that answered to each of these. Um, so you see there again, traffic congestion at 88%, uh, vehicular safety and accidents at 60%. Uh, growth of development at 56% and quality of development at 51%. So there is concern uh, regarding certainly the transportation aspects of the community and also uh, the development quality and growth of the community. At the, uh, at the discovery workshop in March, on March 22nd, we asked folks to uh, tell us uh, what made them proud of Boiling Springs and uh, what makes you proud to be part of the community that is Boiling Springs. And we also ask this question on all of our intercept surveys uh, and at our pop-up meetings. So um, we've got uh, certainly, again, uh, over 500 folks uh, coming in and answering this question for us. And so uh, here, here's a, uh, what we call a word cloud, and uh, basically the size of the uh, text in this word cloud indicates uh, the more significant number of comments or, or, or more folks agreeing with that terminology. And you can see here that caring community is our largest or most prominent uh, text in this word cloud. And uh, that was something that uh, was very interesting as we, as we did this. We had lots of folks that spoke of Boiling Springs being a caring community. They said this in a variety of ways. They talked about the, the kindness of the people, uh, the way we take care of one another, the support that we provide to one another. Um, and so actually, caring community, uh, I got uh, twice as many comments as, as any of the other uh, things that were mentioned. But you can also see other things here, schools, uh, family friendly, great hometown, churches, uh, small town feel. And so there's a variety of things that folks are just really proud of in this community. We also went through a few exercises with you uh, where we asked about transportation preferences. And we uh, gave you uh, six different transportation types to choose from. Uh, standard streets, multimodal streets, sidewalks, bike facilities, trails, greenways, and public transportation. You can see here that trails and greenways uh, were the top uh, vote getter in this, but number two and three were very close behind with sidewalks at 75% and multimodal streets at 74%. So essentially those three uh, transportation types were pretty much a dead heat. And again, uh, the reason that uh, these do not equal 100% when you add them together is that respondents were allowed to pick three of these uh, to tell us their top three choices. Um, Similarly, we ask about development preferences. We ask folks um, what, uh, what were their preferences on development types, 
and you see here larger lot single family residential, smaller lot single family residential, multifamily residential, shopping centers, mixed use villages, parks and open space. And you can see off the charts, parks and open space was the highest vote getter. A larger lot single family residential came behind that. And then this idea of mixed use villages, uh, which is where we actually put a variety of uses together, rather than it just being a shopping center with retail, or a neighborhood with residential, or a park, an open space, we actually put those things into one site. And we say, you know, why can't we have uh, residential, retail, uh, office, uh, parks and open space all together where we can access them very easily. And so those were our top 300 development preferences. We also asked uh, folks at the public meeting uh, or the public workshop on March 22nd to look at a variety of priority spectrums, uh, which essentially we, we use these to look at trade-offs. Uh, obviously, we cannot have everything, and so we asked folks to look at these and place dots uh, where they would find their priority. And so we'll go through those very quickly. Access management priorities. You can see uh, the description here says when a person driving a car decides to stop turn or change lanes, there's the potential for conflict with other people driving, walking, and bicycling. Access management organizes vehicle movements through strategic driveway placement, left turn consolidation, and property connectivity. Um, respondents rated this as a very high priority. Uh, you can see here that the majority of folks were either in the moderate to high priority or high priority category for access management. So that is uh, something that we wanted to put into the mix as we thought about ideas and concepts for the future. Similarly, land use priorities. This says that every parcel of land has some type of land use that occurs on it, such as agricultural, residential, commercial, institutional, and vacant. Land use refers to the type, style, and character of development and the built environment. Again, here we see the moderate to high priority and the high priority scored the very highest in this. And so again, the community is putting a high priority on land use uh, moving forward. And this is reflective of, you know, when we ask the question of would you support uh, additional emphasis on these things where 68% of respondents said that they would. Another uh, of the priority spectrums was mobility choice. There are many ways that people can travel, driving a car, riding a bus, walking, and bicycling, to name a few. The types of transportation facilities we provide influence our mobility choices. You can see here that this one was kind of all across the board. There was no clear uh, winners or losers here. So uh, this may be an indication that folks uh, don't have agreement on mobility choice. It may also be an indication that there may need to be a bit more education in this regard just to understand what mobility choice means. Streetscape priorities. Streets are public spaces where people interact, gather, and travel. A streetscape refers to the design quality of a street and its surrounding environment, including lighting, landscaping, decorative elements, and street furniture. You can see here, again, not a clear differential, but certainly between moderate priority, moderate to high priority, and high priority, most of the votes were put in those, those sections of the uh, priority spectrum for streetscape. So there's certainly a desire for an emphasis on the attractiveness and the uh, comfort, comfort of our streetscapes. Another activity that we had at the Discovery Workshop was what we call a visual preference survey. And this is where we showed a series of photographs and we had, simply asked people to tell us whether, we, whether they like them or dislike them. Um, and so here we're going to share with you uh, some of the most liked photos and some of the least liked photos. So this photo here, 89% of people liked it. Um, it's a trail uh, type setting. 85% uh, of people liked this uh, photograph, again, a trail. And if you recall, when we uh, asked folks about their uh, transportation preferences, uh, trails and greenways were the number one uh, choice or preference. And then 81% uh, like this photograph, and keep in mind under development types, so when we asked for preferences, uh, we had a very high percentage of folks saying parks and recreation uh, was their preference for development. And then this photograph as well, 78% like this photograph, which again, this falls into that recreation category, but it's a little more passive uh, type of recreation. 
uh, something that uh, the Boiling Springs community currently does not have a lot of. We, we have a lot of active parks where we have playing fields and uh, playgrounds and that sort of thing, but we don't have a lot of uh, more passive ones where we can uh, bring our family and just enjoy some time uh, just outside and uh, taking a break. So for the uh, most disliked photos, uh, this one was that 72 percent of folks dislike this photograph. Um, it's a very urban setting. I don't think uh, there was any surprise that folks didn't like it and the reality is we put in a variety of photographs into this visual preference survey because we wanted to know what you liked and didn't like. Um, and it was perfectly fine to say you didn't like a photograph. That was part of the process. 69% uh, dislike this photograph and uh, again it's kind of a, a wide uh, road type trail setting. Um, I think uh, you know we, we talked with a lot of people and uh, one of the things about this is it's a bit confusing. It seems too big to be a trail and too small to be a road. Um, and so I think uh, you know there's there was certainly 69% of folks did not care for this photograph. 65% of folks did not like this photograph. Uh, it is a wide road. Uh, you've got a bicycle facility. The green paint uh, can be off-putting to folks. Um, you've got a bicycle facility that's kind of out in the middle of the road uh, with a bicyclist having to maneuver between, between the travel lanes. Um, so that was 65% of folks did not like this photograph. So just to share with you a few, few photo, other photographs, but these are actually uh, from Boiling Springs. Um, so this is, this is a photograph of Boiling Springs. Uh, this also is Boiling Springs. Uh, again, this is our community, Boiling Springs. And this is Boiling Springs. The things that make up our community are, are a myriad uh, of development types. Um, this, of course, is Boiling Springs, our, uh, uh, the history and uh, the relocated site of one of the springs. But then you look down in that spring, and that's also what folks give an impression of Bowling Springs with uh, the, the trash and the debris in there. Um, today, uh, unfortunately, this is part of Bowling Springs right now. We have uh, vacant storefronts in certain places. Um, but then we have things that we take great pride in as well. Um, Upstate Family Resource Center, our school district, our library. Uh, folks are very proud of these parts of Bowling Springs. Uh, the lake is certainly uh, something that we see as an extension of our community. Um, this is also a very common site in Bowling Springs. We are a growing community with, with lots of uh, new houses going in. Uh, with, we are also a rural community uh, with lots of pristine uh, green fields uh, that uh, are beautiful landscapes. But then we also have Highway 9 and we have uh, you know, clutter of signs and uh, lots of traffic and uh, just, uh, you know, a myriad of uh, distractions within our community as well. But then we have, again, things we take pride in. Uh, this is Boiling Springs. These are Boiling Springs. But this also is Boiling Springs. So this raises the question, what is Boiling Springs? Um, how do we identify ourselves, and how do others perceive us? And one of the things that uh, really stood out to me as, as we've gone through this process, through this workshop, uh, community visioning workshop process, is uh, as I spoke and heard from folks that actually live in our community, um, we, we have one impression of Boiling Springs, and we, we think of ourselves as a, as a rural community. Um, others who just visit us or maybe come out uh, to do some shopping or, or what have you on Highway 9, uh, Highway 9 is their perspective of Boiling Springs because they don't really venture off of it and they don't see uh, that just a few hundred feet off of Highway 9 it is a rural uh, community. The other thing that we you know see happening is that we are a rural community but lots of that rural uh, landscape is being is being developed and gobbled up and so we're changing. Uh, very dramatically. We asked folks, what is your wish for Boiling Springs? If you had a magic wand, what would be your wish for Boiling Springs? And we got a variety of comments back, and again, this was done, uh, this question was asked at the Discovery Workshop on uh, March 22nd, but it was also asked in all of our intercept surveys uh, prior to that. And again, another word cloud here. And the number one thing uh, that was wished for our community was planning, uh, some type of planning. Uh, people said this in a variety of ways. They said that they would like, you know, sign controls, they would like development controls, they would like to see a 
plan for future growth, um, but planning was the number one thing that folks wanted. Uh, family and youth attractions uh, came just behind that. Uh, wanting to keep our youth here, that was a, that was a phrase that, or a, a sentiment that we heard often, that we want our children to grow up here, we want this to be their hometown, and we want them to stay here or return here after school. Um, community pool, YMCA, those were things that were also mentioned uh, very highly. Sidewalks and trails, uh, again, uh, in this exercise we heard, heard about sidewalks and trails just as we had in previous ones. So throughout this presentation, we're going to share comments that we received uh, through the, the previous outreach that's been done, whether it be through intercept surveys or at uh, the discovery workshop. And so the first uh, quote that we wanted to share with you from a participant was, I wish a process like this had been done 15 years ago. Boiling Springs would be a very different place today. And to that end, uh, we'll share with you uh, some, some aerial photography. Um, uh, this is from 1995. Uh, this is Boiling Springs, what I'll call Boiling Springs proper. Uh, so we're not capturing the lake. We're not, you know, getting getting all of the uh, edges of what we would call our community. But we are kind of honing in right on that Highway 9 corridor, uh, Rainbow Lake Road, Old Furnace Road, uh, Paris Bridge Road area, Valley Falls. Um, and you can see here, uh, in 1995, um, you know, this was the level of development that we had in our community. So this is just uh, 23 years ago, um, so not, not a lifetime ago, but uh, just 23 years ago. Um, now if you'll, if you'll see these, all of these yellow polygons uh, that have been put up on, up on the screen, um, all of these in 1995 were undeveloped properties. Um, uh, didn't mean that there wasn't something happening. Some of them may have been, you know, certainly agricultural, um, but some of them just wooded properties. Um, and so uh, all of these properties in 1995 were undeveloped. Now, as we move just 10 years into the future uh, to 2005, you see that all of those within a 10-year period uh, began to have development on them. Uh, they began to be cleared. They began to have uh, either commercial properties put in or residential properties, uh, sometimes institutional as well. We had, uh, you know, some, some level of school development occur as well. Um, but uh, all of this happened within a 10-year period. Uh, then if we uh, look into the next period, you see these blue polygons. Um, not as many places, uh, 2005 to 2015, here is the 2015 aerial. You see that these areas are now developed as well. Keep in mind that about half of that decade was during the Great Recession, um, and so there was a, a slowdown. Um, now what's really interesting though is when we begin to look uh, here most recently, uh, all of these green polygons, uh, in 2015, these were undeveloped properties, and just two years later, in 2017, you see that they are developing. And of course, we don't have an aerial for 2018, uh, but um, I think it's safe to say that just about the same number of properties is, is being developed currently. Um, and so I guess, you know, what we want to take from that is we certainly, uh, all those yellow polygons that you see in that 10-year period from 1995 to 2005, uh, currently, we are definitely on a similar pace, if not a more rapid pace for development. And so we, we only show this to you just to emphasize the amount of change that has taken place in 23 years, or 22 years based on this aerial, and uh, that that growth and change is continuing to happen, and so we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, another workshop participant said, we need less traffic and bigger roads. So how about that? What, what is the capacity of a street? When we talk about bigger roads, what, what does that do for us? So uh, this is not in Bowling Springs, but uh, this is just, we want to talk about the capacity of a road for a moment. Uh, to a lot of people, this road probably looks like it has good capacity. Um, the traffic's not too backed up. Uh, you've got a number of travel lanes. You do have a sidewalk uh, that's kind of separated from the road, so that's nice. Uh, so there's good capacity here in some people's eyes. Other folks will look at this road and say, this has good capacity. You've got uh, good travel lanes, you've got a bike lane, sidewalk, uh, not too much traffic, so good capacity there. Uh, someone who's a bicyclist might say, this is, has even better capacity because I have a separated bike lane, I have uh, you know, a very dedicated and uh, comfortable space, I still have travel lanes, 
I've got nice landscaping, I've got a sidewalk as well. But what truly is the capacity of a street and who are we trying to accommodate? Uh, first of all, it's important to know that street users come in a variety of types. Uh, we're not just designing streets for cars. We need to design it for all user types. So that means that we have certain mobile users, we have certain static users, and we have different vulnerabilities among those users. Uh, obviously, if I am walking or riding a bicycle, I am much more vulnerable than if I'm inside of a car or a truck or an SUV or a bus. Um, if I own property, if I live or work along, the, along a street, um, I'm a user of that street too. And in fact, I'm more affected by that street than the folks that uh, actually travel up and down it because I, I have to deal with that street on a daily basis, 24-7. Uh, and so we need to factor in all of these users when we talk about designing streets. Not just, it's not just about moving cars. Um, so just as an analogy here, I've got two bottles of milk. Um, and for all intents and purposes, these look like the same bottle of milk, right? So uh, how would I choose between those? But now when I uh, add a little more information to these bottles of milk, uh, I suddenly realize they're different. Um, but the milk itself the, is the same. It's of a good quality. Um, but one costs $4 and the other costs $2. So naturally as a consumer, if those bottles of milk are equal in quality, uh, then I'm going to purchase the cheaper one. Uh, and so I will purchase that cheaper bottle of milk. Um, and because it's cheaper, I might buy more of that milk. Uh, certainly when a commodity is at a lower price or more readily available, we buy more of it. We, we consume more of it. That is uh, just uh, the nature of the marketplace. Um, and so with that, uh, we, we have a bottle of milk that we buy. Uh, we take that bottle of milk home, we drink the milk. Um, Farmers understand that, hey, folks are drinking the milk, so they've got, a, got their cows out there making the milk. Um, and the more milk that's drank, they said, well, now we're going to produce more milk because people are buying that milk. And the cycle continues. We buy more milk. We drink more milk. Farmers say, hey, let's get more cows into production making that milk. And in fact, it may not be just the same farmers. Uh, may have been Farmer Brown, but now maybe Farmer Jones uh, says, you know, I'm going to quit uh, growing strawberries. I'm going to get me some cows and uh, make some more milk because that's what's selling right now. And so we put more milk into the marketplace and more milk gets consumed because of that. A road is very similar to that. Um, we can look at our road here. It's a two-lane road uh, out in the country. Um, and folks start driving on that road, you know, and uh, as folks find that road and they realize that they can get places on that road, uh, it may become a, a bit congested. And so we say, you know, folks are drinking the milk that is this road, um, so let's make some more milk uh, to accommodate that. And so for a time, uh, we now have additional capacity on that road. But then more people find that milk and they consume that milk and they say, hey, this is a great road. I want to be over on this road and travel there because I can travel easier on this road. And so we say, let's produce more milk um, or more road, if you will. And so again, as folks find that road, it once again begins to grow crowded. So, you know, what's the difference between these roads? Well, you know, at a two lane, at a four lane, at a six lane, Eventually, they all become crowded and congested because folks find the paths of least resistance. They find where the, the, the cheaper or more consumable areas of our economy are, and that's just like with the milk. We're going to find these roads and we're, going to, we're, going to, we're not going to be able to widen our way out of congestion. So some of the things we want to talk about in this, in this, in this workshop is um, how do we get out of congestion? Uh, what are the ways to do that? It's interesting when you go to Google um, and you uh, Google road congestion uh, and you look at the images that come up, uh, there's no pictures of small roads. Um, all of them are large roads. And so the idea would be, you know, if, if widening roads reduces congestion, then why are big roads congested? Um, so again, we want to look at what are, the, what are the true causes of congestion and how can we remedy that. Another participant said, I would like to see some planning go into new retail establishments. Do we really need that much pizza? Uh, this comment was very comical to me. Uh, it does seem like right now that Bowling Springs uh, has uh, a wealth of uh, pizza locations, but apparently uh, the market uh, supports that uh, or they wouldn't open up. But uh, to this question, we did want to uh, add another. Uh, Chick-fil-A is wonderful. Everyone wants to go there, but it is in a horrible location. We need to control business locations and entryways. 
And so with this, we wanted to talk about uh, how do we look at that. Um, if you recall with the priority spectrums exercises, we talked about access management. And you can see here, uh, this is just a one mile stretch of Highway 9 uh, starting at uh, Rainbow Lake Road and running uh, to Valley Falls Road. And each of the red dots that you see here is a driveway or side street that uh, has a full movement that is not signalized. And so what we mean by that is that each of these driveways or side streets can uh, be turned into and out of from any direction. So I can turn right or left out of them. I can turn right or left into them. And uh, there is no signal control on these, so they are fully reliant on uh, the good judgment of the drivers uh, making these turns. Um, so we, we are trusting uh, that the drivers on Highway 9 in this area will, will understand that. Um, and so what's interesting about each of these, each of these red dots is uh, each of these red dots has a certain crash potential to it, and uh, each one of them has approximately uh, 10 uh, crash potentials, and uh, those are modal conflict points. And so um, within this one mile of Highway 9 between Valley Falls Road and Rainbow Lake Road, there are 75 full movement, non-signalized driveways and side streets, uh, which that actually results in over 750 modal conflicts. Uh, which we also would know these as potential crash locations. Uh, so this is where the path of a car and a car might cross, or the path of a pedestrian and a car, or a path of a bicyclist and a pedestrian. And so what happens there is uh, we end up with all of these modal conflicts. Now, uh, for each one of these driveways or side streets that we were to limit to a right in, right out, so essentially we would take away the left turn movements, uh, for each one of them, we would reduce its crash potential by 40 to 50 percent. Um, and so the reality is you have here a series of driveways and side streets, and so we don't have to adjust all of them. And again, this is only one mile of, of Highway 9. Um, we don't have to convert all of them to right in and right out, but for each one that we can, we are reducing crash conflicts uh, significantly. So back to this, uh, this statement about the Chick-fil-A, uh, here's the site uh, that, is in, you know, that was mentioned at Rainbow Lake Road and Highway 9. Uh, you, we have the Chick-fil-A on the corner, uh, uh, certain other land uses surrounding it, as you can see. And uh, again, what we wanted to do is just talk about why, why is this a frustrating site? And uh, so it's not to be uh, critical of uh, Chick-fil-A or any of the other businesses in the area. It's just to talk about site design in a manner uh, that we can relate to because it's a site we know and we understand. So first off, uh, the access points, uh, there's only two access points into the Chick-fil-A and uh, they require these non-controlled movements onto and off of uh, major streets. So uh, the only way to get to the Chick-fil-A is from Rainbow Lake Road and Highway 9, which are both very high volume roads. Um, and therefore, uh, and there's no, there's no signal control here either. So we're, again, we're relying on drivers to use good judgment coming in and out of this property. Uh, another issue with this is the, the distance uh, that these two driveways are from this major intersection of, of two very busy roads. Uh, the drivers are too close to the intersection, uh, creating issues with traffic backups. So uh, not only here on Rainbow Lake Road, you can already see the vehicular queue or the line of cars forming there, is already back uh, to the, the Chick-fil-A drive. And so if that, if that line of cars or queue length gets longer, then we can't even get into the Chick-fil-A. Uh, also from time to time, uh, the Chick-fil-A will back out onto Rainbow Lake Road, um, which then causes folks not to be able to get to the signalized intersection to make their turn. Um, so uh, that, uh, those are of concern. Um, so, so what you know? What's different? Uh, let's let's look at the remainder of this site. Uh, here at the, the three green circles, you can see the access points uh, to Arby's, Wendy's, and Captain D's. And these actually, uh, there are multiple access points, and two of the three of these are off of major streets. Uh, so we're actually turning off of Highway Nine or Rainbow Lake Rainbow Lake Road to to get to these businesses. Um, additionally, all three of these businesses are, are connected. Uh, they have what we call interpersonal connectivity, which allows me to travel between them easily and also to share these three driveways, uh, which makes it, makes it much more convenient as well. 
Um, so those are some you know quality design, site design characteristics. Um, the other thing is we look at uh, the Chick-fil-A, the Papa John's, the GameStop location. It is, uh, it is on an island and the Wendy's, the Arby's, the Captain D's are not because again they have multiple access points um, and they can get, you can go between uh, the, the businesses. They are not on an island. So uh, as we begin to look at this, and again, we just want to share some ideas and concepts. So we are certainly not recommending uh, that Chick-fil-A change the way it does business. We're not suggesting that uh, the South Carolina Department of Transportation go out here and require them to make these changes. We're just saying what could be done differently to make this better. Um, and so first off, if those driveways that are, that are close uh, to the intersection um, and have these uh, uncontrolled movements, if those, those two driveways were, were closed, but then if we were to relocate some access points, so create additional better access with, with more options, with safer options. So you can see here by the green arrows that we can move the driveway of the Chick-fil-A back. Uh, which would actually help with the with the drive through traffic because the way the site is designed it does require you to go all the way around the building uh, to get into the drive through lane well currently folks will try to sneak into the driveway through lane because they're entering at the lower part of the site or the front of the of the site um, with this scenario you would come in at the back of the site which would naturally send you around the building also, if we could get connectivity between the Chick-fil-A and the Applebee's, between the Papa John's and the Captain D's area, uh, then suddenly we begin to connect all of these sites and we begin to have a multitude of options. Uh, the photograph that you see in the lower right-hand corner is, uh, on the, on the right-hand side of that photograph is the Chick-fil-A parking lot, on the left-hand side is the Applebee's parking lot, and you see that a connection here uh, would be very easy to achieve. Again, I want to emphasize that these are ideas. Uh, does not mean that these things have to be done. Does not even mean that we're recommending they be done. But we want to just suggest that there are ways to reduce congestion, reduce conflict between modes um, that are pretty simple, that don't require millions of dollars to make these fixes. Uh, just to further talk about interparcel connectivity, uh, this is a, a site in Lexington, South Carolina, so just west of Columbia. Um, US 378 or Sunset Boulevard is the main, uh, the main road here. All of the red lines that you see, have no, there's no driveways along these frontages. So you see there's a lot of businesses that front the road, but there are no driveways there. Uh, there are uh, shared driveways that enter the site, and then everywhere where you see the green arrows, these are parcel connectivity. So essentially, on this site, um, I can go from the Publix and the stores that surround it all the way up to the Lowe's and the, and the, uh, the fast food Zaxby's up there at the top of the photograph um, and never get out on the main road on Sunset Boulevard. And so what's powerful about this is we begin to not only uh, facilitate traffic within the sites, uh, but we also remove traffic from the main line. So uh, site design like this in Boiling Springs could help to pull uh, traffic congestion off of Highway 9 and distribute it through sites along Highway 9. Uh, we are starting to see some of this occur in our own community. Uh, this is some new, new uh, development that's just occurred in the last uh, few months. Uh, the Starbucks, the Marcos, the Popeyes, uh, of course the Popeyes has been there a little longer and the AutoZone has been there longer still. Uh, but this is uh, at the intersection of Rainbow Lake Road and number nine. And you can see here that the AutoZone, the Popeyes, the Marcos, and the Starbucks, none of these have their own driveways on the Highway 9. All of them are accessed from the traffic signal at Rainbow Lake uh, and Highway 9 or at McMillan Extension and Highway 9. Um, and there is a access road behind these properties that link them together. And what's been powerful about this is traffic has not uh, snarled down around these new land uses because it's being treated in a very efficient manner where we're, we're feeding most of this traffic through a signalized intersection, which is, which is a very powerful way to deal with, with new development. Another workshop participant said, people should be able to do anything they want to with their private property, but we don't need more apartments. Um, so there's a bit of a conflict or a contradiction in this statement. Um, obviously, if we say we want to let people do anything they want to with their property, but then we also say a limit on that, no more apartments, um, then that conflicts. And so let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, first of all, in Boiling Springs, we know that there is a housing demand. Uh, all of Spartanburg County has a housing demand right now. Uh, July 1st uh, of this past year, uh, there was uh, a article in the Herald Journal 
and on Go Upstate that spoke about this uh, housing, the challenging housing market and the boom. Um, new single, fa single housing residential construction permits have steadily increased every year since 2011, and Boiling Springs is one area in particular that is considered a high demand area. So the market is demanding housing. Um, and so let's talk about that. How does this work? So there's housing demand out there. Um, we can't really influence housing demand. Uh, if folks are moving to this area, if folks want new homes, uh, that is a market uh, that is alive, uh, that has its own uh, kind of consciousness that it, it is going to happen. Uh, what we can do is we can, we can change the way we respond to housing demand. So essentially, if we have uh, very limited or no restrictions on, on development, uh, and then we have housing demand, then basically what happens is the market forces totally drive uh, the everything about uh, how how development occurs. On the other hand, if we have some level of development regulations, and again, these don't have to be onerous, uh, they don't have to be burdensome, but if we at least in some way say how we would like to see demand occur, then market forces will still drive it because essentially uh, folks are not going to build something they can't sell, but uh, we will also be able to influence it with our community desires. So we can say what we would kind of like, uh, how we'd like that uh, housing to look and where it ought to be placed and of what quality and character it should be. So we are able to influence that with some development. I uh, just wanted to share some different de subdivision design standards or, or, or uh, concepts. Uh, there's a lot of concepts where we can do things that feel and look more rural but still get single family homes. Uh, to occur in our communities, to get park-like settings in our communities. So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, the type of development we've always seen in, in Spartanburg County or within Boiling Springs itself. We can encourage more open space, more conservation of land if that's what we want to see. Um, here is a, is a beautiful example of, uh, of a uh, kind of a conservation subdivision. You see that it's got a very rural, uh, village quaint uh, feel to it. Uh, but yet it still accommodates the growth that is occurring in a community. Also multifamily homes. Um, I, you know, obviously there are folks that do not want to see apartments occurring in Bowling Springs, but the reality is we've also said that we'd like our young people uh, to stay here and live here. And uh, when, when young people are coming uh, out of school or if they you know, didn't, didn't attend college, uh, their means, uh, their income may be totally different uh, than, than you or I who have, who have been out in the working world for 20, 30, 40 plus years. And so if we want our children to live here, we have to give them the ability to live here. Um, and so to say that we won't have any apartments at all, um, that's, uh, that's not gonna allow that to happen. We also have uh, certain folks uh, within our communities, maybe uh, disabled folks who um, who cannot uh, take care of big yards, who cannot take care of homes. They need they need something that's lower maintenance, uh, something that does not require them to deal with a yard and acreage. And so uh, these these are you know important to have as well. And they can be done in a quality fashion. Again, so another workshop participant said, "No more subdivisions without knowing and solving the traffic impacts." So this is, a, this is a very interesting statement because, again, um, is, is it the subdivisions that are the problem or is it the traffic impacts created by those subdivisions? So just wanted to take a quick look at uh, five uh, subdivisions here in Bowling Springs. Uh, these subdivisions are Candlewood to the north, uh, then just uh, Sterling Estates just south of that. Uh, south of Sterling Estates is uh, Eagle Point. Um, the uh, tradition is uh, just off to the east there, the small, uh, long neighborhood that is going in currently. Um, and then Winbrook is uh, kind of at the bottom of the photograph. Um, in the middle of all this is Sholey Creek Elementary School. Uh, you can see it there right near Winbrook and south of uh, tradition. And so we've got these neighborhoods, but as you can see right now, all of these neighborhoods are on islands. Uh, they all uh, have uh, pretty much singular, uh, one way in, one way out. Uh, Candlewood does have two ways out, but they're both onto the same road, uh, Old Furnace Road. Um, and so essentially, if, if I live in Sterling Estates and I need to get out to Old Furnace Road, um, so if I'm, I'm here in, in Sterling, if I'm in Sterling Estates and I need to get out to Old Furnace Road, um, then I currently have to come out uh, onto Highway 9, uh, travel Highway 9 to the north, and then take a right onto Old Furnace Road and move out. Um, if if uh, these neighborhoods had been designed differently, and again, we're not proposing uh, that anything be changed today, 
But uh, what we're trying to consider is when we design neighborhoods and when we put them in in the future, if we design them differently where these two neighborhoods were actually connected to one another, uh, then if I were in Sterling Estates, uh, I could go to Candlewood and out to Old Furnace and I could really shorten that drive and, and take, again, pressures off of Highway 9. Um, but but let's look at look at connectivity even in a different way. Um, so here's uh, Sholey Creek Elementary. Uh, it's it's right there, uh, kind of the kind of the plus shaped building in the in the upper upper area of the photograph, uh, kind of to the right. Um, and then we have uh, you know Sterling. Sterling I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Eagle Point. And let's say if my home is is in Eagle Point, and uh, my kids uh, go to school at Sholey Creek Elementary School. You can see here. Uh, currently today, for me to drive them to school, uh, this is my route uh, to take my children to school. Um, and so with this, uh, I've got uh, 2.8 miles of driving. I go through four traffic lights. That's a 10 minute drive in rush hour, and that does not account for the time for the drop-off line. So 10 minutes gets me to the site of the school. And then once I'm on the site of the school, I'd have to sit in a drop-off line as well. Um, so now we're not, you know, again, these are not proposals. These are ideas that as we move forward uh, with development in our community, if we can encourage these types of ideas. So uh, looking at this, uh, what if uh, I had a trail uh, connection that came through here? And keep in mind, we would have to work things out, uh, such as uh, crossing Big Shelly Creek. Uh, there, the, the school does sit on a hill, so we'd have to come up that hill. But essentially, we can make a very, very short trail connection. Um, and in walking, that's only 2,000 feet. It's probably a seven, maybe eight minute walk. And I'm gonna burn at least 25 calories doing that. Um, biking, it's still that 2,000 feet. It's only about a five minute bike ride and I'm gonna burn at least 60 calories. Um, and so this begins to show you that we could have a uh, much more efficient linkages. It doesn't require roads. It doesn't require anything all that invasive or impactful. Uh, but just these these key connections that just that make make good sense. Um, even more closely to home here, again, Sholey Creek Elementary, uh, sitting uh, here, the kind of the plus sign building at the top of the photo. At the bottom of the photo is the Winbrook subdivision, and uh, we could very easily have a trail connection uh, running from here to here, which would be a very easy walk to school uh, for for children. Um, but we also, if we zoom in and we just look at this one area at the front of the neighborhood and at the front of the school property, uh, you can see here that we have a sidewalk uh, that comes from the school and ends. We have a sidewalk that comes from the neighborhood and ends. And just a very simple sidewalk connection there would suddenly make it much more plausible uh, for moms, dads, uh, and their children to walk to school and, and not have to get out into that traffic and get out into the uh, drop-off line at the school. Um, a cartoonist uh, within our company, uh, Ian Lockwood, uh, put this together. Uh, it says, there is too much traffic for Billy to walk to school, so we drive him. And again, this is the idea. Uh, it's traffic inducing traffic. Um, that uh, when, when we add one more car uh, to make these short trips that could be done in a different fashion, then we put more traffic and stress on our roadways. Uh, this is something that we're seeing. Uh, already in our community. This is the new sidewalk that went in on Old Furnace Road. Um, it's a uh, great connection uh, that, that links neighborhoods to the high school. Um, and again, so this, this begins to get some of that connectivity we're talking about. So we're already making some, some strides in this direction. So the key themes that we heard uh, throughout this workshop process is uh, that uh, we as a community desire better planning for the future. Uh, we are a caring community. We take care of one another. This is our hometown. Our history is important to us. Lots of folks talked about the, the Boiling Springs themselves uh, as being the, where, you know, where our community started um, and also just the, the proud history we have, uh, not only uh, with the Springs, but with, uh, with our war heroes and that types of things, those types of things. Uh, we're proud that we're not a city. Uh, we, we like the fact that we're rural. We like that we still got pasture land and, and agricultural uses. And we want to con continue to be that type of community. Uh, we want our youth to love it here. We want our youth to stay here, uh, to grow here, and to, and to live here. Uh, we desire sidewalks and trails, and, and we like to eat. There were lots of mentions of restaurants uh, throughout this, uh, this process. 
Um, so from that, we came up with uh, four guiding principles. And so basically what we've done is we've taken all the comments we've received and we've tried to summarize them uh, into these guiding principles to have an understanding of, of where we need to move into the future. And so heritage, community, family, and legacy are those four principles. And so let's break those down. Heritage. Um, we, we want to identify with our history as a place of hospitality. We want to celebrate the spring for which we are named. We value our rural agricultural roots, and we embrace our role as an alternative to urban living. The second guiding principle is family. We want to afford opportunities for youth to live, play, and stay. We want to connect our children to our schools, both academically and physically. We want to foster strong, connected neighborhoods. We want to encourage healthy, active lifestyles. The third guiding principle, community. We want to be true to our reputation as a caring community. Center daily living along natural green corridors. Advance development patterns, patterns that increase social interaction and focus primary commercial development in a central place along Highway 9. And finally, that fourth guiding principle is legacy. We would like to develop a clear plan and path for the growth of our community. We want to maintain and enhance the strength and reputation of School District 2. We would like to balance our transportation network to improve safety, minimize impacts, and increase choices. And we would like to provide future generations a hometown that is truly Boiling Springs. And so from this, we took these guiding principles and we put together a vision statement. And the key things to remember about a vision statement is a vision statement should personify who we want to be as a community. It may not be who we are today, but it's who we want to be. A vision statement should be aspirational. It should be inspirational. It should be a big tent that a lot of folks can get under with us. We don't have to uh, talk about our differences in a vision statement. We want to talk about what makes us common, what makes us, what makes us a community that it comes together. And then finally, we want to dream big. Vision statements are not a time to limit ourselves. It's not a time to talk about the things we can't do. It's a time to talk about the things we would aspire and dream to do. And so with that, the vision statement for Boiling Springs that has been created and is presented to the community is that Boiling Springs is where great people, vibrant lifestyles, and hometown hospitality converge to form a community that embraces its past, plans for its future, and is bubbling with possibilities. We foster strong connections in our personal and professional relationships, school system, transportation network, and development patterns. Boiling Springs has grown to have the amenities that make life easy while retaining a rural heritage that makes life full. And so from this, we begin to talk about how do we get that message out? How do we move that vision to reality? Uh, and first off is the idea of branding or identity. Um, and so again, this is a concept of a brand for Boiling Springs. It doesn't mean it's the right one. It just means let's generate some ideas. Let's talk about things. And so rather than showing you a blank sheet of paper, we wanted to show you a concept of an identity or branding. So here you can see the Boiling Springs. Uh, with kind of the, the idea of the steam coming up out of the center and the tagline, a caring community bubbling with possibilities. And so again, this is just one idea of what branding could look like. There may be others that, uh, that are just as good or better, uh, but we wanted to give an idea of that. And so then how does our vision translate into tangible community design? How do we begin to say, how do we put that vision into practice? And so First off, we wanted to talk about trails and greenways briefly because this is something that we heard loud and clear that this community would like to see. And so we put together a, a conceptual trail network. Uh, this network uh, has trails running along uh, McMillan Boulevard, um, uh, up Big Sholey Creek. Uh, we also have it along Valley, I mean, I'm sorry, along uh, Hanging Rock Road. Um, and also Double Bridge Road, as well as Highway 9. Um, and the Highway 9 connection actually connects to the existing bike lanes and sidewalks on the, on the, on the more recent widening of Highway 9. Um, McMillan Boulevard uh, is a key connection because it connects uh, two parks, it connects numerous neighborhoods, it connects the high school property. Um, and that's an area that could really uh, thrive uh, as, a, as a trail connectivity uh, portion. 
And so this is that stretch along McMillan Boulevard. This is the school's property that we're looking at. And again, we want to emphasize that this is an idea. We're not, uh, to not, we're not you know, as part of this process, we're not saying this needs to happen tomorrow. We're just saying, what could this look like? We want to generate ideas, we want to generate concepts that get people thinking. And so this is the current condition. And if we were to have a trail in this area, this is what it could look like. And it could begin to connect our schools, our parks, our homes uh, together, as well as our retail along Highway 9. Um, also, we want to talk about growth because one of the things that the county's area performance planning process is going to do is it's going to look at where and how uh, the, this area of the county should grow. And uh, the way they're doing that is they're looking at, uh, at, at uh, a regional road network uh, to, to focus development upon. And so what, uh, what the county will do as part of their process is they'll come in and they'll define uh, what we call arterial roads and collector roads. Um, those have not been defined for this area of the county yet. Um, so what we are using just in concept here are the classifications that SCDOT has placed upon these roads. And so the, the red road that you see there uh, is Highway 9, um, and it is the only arterial currently uh, in, in the Boiling Springs area. And then all of the blue roads you see, those are what we call collectors, and uh, those move traffic uh, between, the ar between an arterial road and uh, the, the homes and, and residences around the area. Um, so they're more of the connectors or, you know, collecting traffic and moving it out to the arterials. And so uh, development will be focused on these types of road classifications. And again, Spartanburg County will define these uh, through their process, but we're using SEDOT's definitions for the time being. Uh, what we begin to see is we have key nodes. We have primary nodes along this network. And those primary nodes that exist today are the intersection of uh, Rainbow Lake, uh, Old Furnace, uh, number nine, um, Valley Falls, uh, Blaylock and number nine, and then uh, Sholey, uh, Sholey Creek and uh, 4th Street and number nine. These are key primary nodes. And so as we begin to think about growth and development, it would be good to congregate development within these primary nodes. And so we begin to kind of put a, put a boundary on those and say if we could focus our primary development and redevelopment in and around here, then we could begin to control uh, the traffic demands on our community and control uh, the, the growth demands and how fast uh, land is being cleared and developed. Uh, but we also have a series of secondary nodes in our community and you can see these illustrated on the map. These are more neighborhood nodes. These are areas that are closer out to some of our subdivisions and neighborhoods and homes. Um, and these are areas too where it's important to have some level of development uh, because if you have a corner store uh, at one of these, so uh, I use as an example the Dollar General uh, that's at the intersection of Old Furnace and Paris Bridge Road. Uh, well, if you live in that vicinity and all you need is a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread, it's very easy to run to the Dollar General there and get that. Or if you need a pack of batteries, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, that keeps you from having to travel all the way into Highway 9 to get those very basic things. Um, and so it takes, again, a traffic load off of the roads uh, by having some of these amenities and conveniences close to neighborhoods. So. These areas around secondary nodes would be lower impact development. So again, just neighborhood services, uh, neighborhood commercial services that would uh, help to alleviate uh, the traffic strain on our roads. And so you begin to see that you have these areas of, of primary nodes and primary development, secondary nodes and secondary development, uh, which then leaves a lot of our community uh, to, you know, to, uh, to be less developed, less impacted. And so again, these are ideas. Uh, again, Spartanburg County will, will bring their planning process and actually uh, work with you folks in the community to determine these things. But we just wanted to kind of get a, a jump start on that and say these are some ideas of how it could work. Uh, certainly, these are not uh, these are not binding. Uh, these are these are not uh, set in stone. These are just ideas. Uh, one option of uh, potentially many that could be considered. And then we overlay our trail network uh, that we previously showed you, and you can begin to see that there's some rationale to that within the developed area as well. Um, give you another. This is a view of Highway Nine. Um, just again, uh, that trail network running up uh, through Highway 9 that we spoke about and just uh, with a higher streetscape and some access management, what could that look like? And we just give you a vision of that. And again, uh, this is an idea. Uh, it's, it's one possible solution um, and it's uh, up to Spartanburg County and this community to determine uh, what, what they truly would like to see. But based on the comments we received, 
uh, this is this is uh, very uh, very comparable uh, with the comments and input we've received from the public. Finally, we wanted to share with you just the catalyst site, and the idea is what could a site uh, in Boiling Springs look like? How could it be uh, developed or redeveloped to fit, uh, to fit kind of the principles we talked about, these guiding principles and the vision for Boiling Springs? Um, and so uh, we, we've taken the, the Bilo site uh, at the corner of uh, Old Furnace Number 9 and McMillan, uh, kind of, and uh, we wanted to look at that site. And again, uh, we fully understand that all of this is private property. Uh, we are not uh, suggesting uh, that uh, these, these uh, property owners do anything with their property. We're not suggesting that anyone acquire their property. We simply thought, let's take a site that people know and understand um, and let's look at it. And there were two primary reasons that we selected this site. One is that it is the location of, of where the, the spring has been relocated and, and memorial, memorialized. Um, but also, uh, we do have a large anchor store, uh, the Bilo, that, is, that has gone out of business. And so there could be redevelopment potential on this site as well. Um, and so again, just keep in mind that these are concepts and ideas. Uh, but what we wanted to do was begin to look at it. Uh, we, we got inspiration from a variety of places, but the type of development we, we were thinking about, uh, you know, seeing within Bowling Springs is very complementary. Uh, to a rural character uh, that, that Bowling Springs has. Uh, you know, areas that uh, could combine mixed uses, as, as the public told us they'd like to see. Um, areas that are walkable. Um, areas uh, that have things for, for kids, uh, for youth, and for families. So uh, this might be a great site for, for a movie theater. Uh, you know, so, um, so what we wanted to do is, and then of course active, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, passive recreation, thinking about the, the Boiling Spring, the memorialization of that on this site, and how it could become something that's more a part of our community instead of something that's tucked away that we have to go kind of find. Um, so with that, here's the site again. Um, you know, you've got the, the, the large building is the Bilo, um, and then the Boiling Spring is, is over uh, to the left in the, in the grassy area, uh, right beside McMillan uh, Boulevard and number nine. Um, and so we put together a concept plan for this site. And again, this is uh, staying within the confines of the current site. Um, it is looking at the various pieces of property as a whole. Uh, we do understand again that these are private properties and uh, we're just making, uh, we're dreaming a little bit here. So uh, nothing, nothing in stone, nothing uh, certain. I just want to give an idea, but you can see we have central spine roads that, that work through the site. Uh, this would be a, a new six screen theater, uh, kind of similar to the uh, NCG theaters over in Hillcrest area of Spartanburg. Uh, we'd have some out parcels here on the front, maybe for you know a sandwich shop or ice cream shop, things that could happen before or after uh, a night at the movies. Um, we would want uh, the frontage along Highway 9, these would be uh, probably one to one and a half story buildings so that you'd be able to see in and through uh, the site from Highway 9, uh, but also get a nice uh, kind of street wall here. Uh, you see us, uh, you know, the, the trail system would run in front, and then this is the trail that would run along McMillan that would run all the way back up to the high school and beyond, uh, all the way to uh, McMillan Park. Uh, so again, we're, we're linking uh, all of this uh, retail and, and uh, amenities back to the neighborhoods through a trail system. Uh, taking the, the spring uh, memorialization location and actually playing it up, uh, having, you know, some wading pools, some places, splash pad, uh, a little amphitheater type design where, where folks could come out, they could shop, uh, they could take a rest, they could eat their sandwich or lunch over here, have the kids uh, kick, their, kick their shoes off in and, and, and the hot summer months, uh, cool down a little bit, uh, burn off a little steam. Um, and then also in the interior here we look at a mixed use type layout. So again, uh, there would be, there would be uh, room on the upper, upper floors of these buildings to have residential uh, uses with retail on the ground floor um, and actually you know have uh, higher higher end residential that could support this type of an environment. Another feature of this site would be that uh, you could actually close off portions of this for festivals, for gatherings um, uh, that, would, that would be community driven as well. And so again just want to emphasize this is just an idea. It's something that we're putting forward uh, just to kind of get to, to wet folks appetite and begin to thinking about what we could do. Um, and so with that, you know, what comes next? Uh, so tonight we've presented, uh, you know, the, the concepts, we presented the guiding principles that we gathered from the public. 
Uh, we are going to take all of this, we'll put it into a, a final report. That report will be available to the public. It will also uh, be uh, presented to, to Spartanburg County uh, to help them to know and understand the, some of the desires of this community. We do encourage everyone in Boiling Springs to continue to stay involved, continue to make your voice known. Um, continue to make decisions for yourself. Uh, think through the things you've seen in this presentation, but also uh, other comments uh, you may have heard throughout the community and make a balanced uh, decision on, on what you would like to see the future of your community be. Um, of course, uh, the area performance planning process in Spartanburg County will come to Boiling Springs uh, sometime in the not too distant future. And we would uh, encourage you to be involved with that process as well because that is truly gonna be the binding process um, what we've done here is we put together ideas, we put together a vision, uh, but the binding process will come from the county, and so we encourage you to be involved with that process as well. And with that, uh, we thank you for uh, watching this presentation, we thank you for your participation in the community visioning sessions, and we ask you to stay involved. Thank you very much.